For yourself, your beginnings, um, am I right in, 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 in surmising uh, a shared sort of values with the do-it-yourself ethic of punk? We knew nothing about anything. We were, I was 16, the other guys were about 17. Um, we just started the band and we recorded and we put it on cassettes and we did that unaware of what else was going on. It was a need that had to be filled and... Um, Severed Head started in 79, and uh, as we were doing it, we became aware of what was going on in England at the time, which was Throbbing Gristle, Cabaret Voltaire, the Krautrock hangover sort of thing. Uh, in Australia, we had, in Sydney, SPK and uh, that sort of noise sound. Uh, Melbourne was very, very vibrant. We had Whirly World and Tiss 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 and the Primitive Calculators, and as we evolved, we found that we had a community. And it was a community of people you could describe after the event as do-it-yourself. But the thing was, um, everything was a bit of a cottage industry. I mean, you know, we're talking about uh, serious sideburn time, you know, here. Uh, it was a time when if you tried to play live in a pub, then the guy would not let you plug a drum machine through the PA. He'd say, you're going to wreck my PA if you play that thing. Uh, and, and really, funnily enough, it was... a uh, strange change things like my sex having a sequencer on stage that you know you'd say well my sex can do it like oh that's right then you know because they had a single and you know they were on a major and all that so um we did what we did through necessity rather than and knowing anything it just was it was it was just the freedom that you know you were kids and you needed to do it was the drum machine the kind of underlying or defining factor to it? Because it seemed that I, I recall from those days, if we call them geeks, but you know, going to various sort of things, and anything could be used, any, anything was fair game. But was the drum machine the...? Well, the drum machine was the only musician in the band. You know what I mean? I mean, when you were a band like Severed Heads or the rest, uh, chaos could reign, but if there was a drum machine keeping time, there was something that was reminding you that you were doing music. Did you go into conventional pub gigs and... Oh, yeah. What yeah. sort of response? Can you, can you paint uh, a picture of... Well, I remember one time that we played at the San Miguel Tavern up on the north, and we had a tape loop that went from the stage across the bar, around the back of the hall and back again. I think I had somebody screaming or dogs baying or something like that. And this loop would go round and round and round. In the meantime, we were making all that noise up on stage. Oh, they shut us down. Shut us down straight away, you know. <sighs> Out you go. I think only, we've only been beaten up once or twice back then. Um, we played the Mossman Hotel. We played pubs everywhere. So that was the thing, you see. We were an electronic band, but we still played the pubs, and we still got the case of beer at the end of the night. And we lugged, and we did all of that. And uh, we played under bands like the Models and uh, SBK and people like that. We, we did the rock dues. Um, funnily enough, a hybrid between the past and what was coming, because what was coming was still ill-defined. No one knew... I mean, with hindsight, things were changing, but, you know. You mentioned sort of forming a community probably across the country with various pockets of people doing things, but there was one in Surrey Hills, Darlinghurst, I remember gigs, and mm. there was the whole M, M Squared. Well, M maybe squared. you can paint the picture of what Yeah, that... well, M Squared was a label that were down in Wiltshire Street, and they had a four-track and um, four-track tape recorder. They'd knocked a couple of um, terraces together. They lived in one and they recorded in the other. And they had all the local bands coming through, uh, Pell Mill and Slipsick and, uh, you know, Dead Travel Fast, so on and so forth. And they even did a compilation album called A Selection in 1981, which was all the different bands around the place. And funnily enough, none of the bands on it sound like each other. They're completely different. Now, you listen to the album now, it sounds unproduced, hurried, a bit frayed at the edges, but it was a very much a community thing. It was like a bunch of people getting together probably playing to each other when they played live, you know. Um, but there was no particular genre. Uh, you think of a compilation album now, it's going to be all one sort of sound, country or techno or whatever. This was a whole bunch of disparate people. It was a uh, geographic kind of collection, and that seems to be... Geography seemed to matter a lot more then than it does now. You'll have a compilation of 
bands that sound the same from all over the world, rather than having bands that sound different all from one suburb. What was the mood in those times? It had to have been fairly tolerant in some ways because people would be taking risks and sometimes possibly falling flat on their faces, wouldn't they? Well, no one knew uh, what was supposed to be. I mean, that's the thing. Now everybody knows if I make a techno record, people will say the hi-hats uh, hi aren't loud enough. A kick drum doesn't kick, okay? Or they might say that rocks, you know. They might say it fulfills a particular genre. Now, back then, there was no genre. I mean, we had country and we had, you know, Detroit rock and we had all of that sort of caper. But we were, um, as a group of people, reacting against all of that. We hated it. We were full of hate. Um, but the hate was in some ways to do with uh, finding cracks in the edifice and, like, sitting in them. And the cracks were all over it, so you could find different places everywhere. Uh, a band like the Systematics that uh, did the Pulp Baby... Uh, seven inch round at Double J back in 79, I think it was. I mean, the whole sort of flat, it was an incredibly flat single. It was just this sort of monotonal thing. And it was so unhistrionic, un rock and roll. It was just this, this kind of antipathy. And antipathy, as long as there was antipathy, there was a kindred spirit. And the spirit was the thing. Not whether uh, such and such a DJ came down and remixed it, it was a personal thing. You wouldn't let somebody come and remix your stuff, you know. What, you're going into, uh, we're around about that period and going into doing it, you must be looking at the music business and sort of going, well, I don't know that there's a place there for me. So what sort of, I, I suppose, professional or career kind of aspirations, was there any of that about what you were doing? We always knew that we were as good as anyone from anywhere. I mean, moving along to somewhere like 1982, when Severed Heads were playing live, and the other bands around at the time were people like the Human League. Cabaret Voltaire were having their second wind, that sort of thing. And we knew we were as good as those people, and we knew that we deserved as much as those people did. Um, but we did not think uh, that we were going to compete on equal terms. This was the year that we released a cassette um, packaged inside old TV sets uh, that Gary Bradbury, who I worked with, would go along the road finding an old TV set, would gut it, and him and Meredith Adams would build sculptures out of old TV sets, put a cassette inside them, spray paint the whole thing silver, shrink wrap it and hang it up in the local record store. Now, at the time, we thought that was just as good as anything that was happening anywhere. But screw the whole lot of them. We hated them, they hated us, it was fine. It was funny that in 1983, um, the fella comes down from England and we get signed up to an English label. And... Um, in fact, our first commercially released album came out in England before it came out in Australia, which is an old story. I'm sure you've been told that before, even on this history. Um, and we had to put stuff out over there to, to get heard. But uh, we always knew that there was a slight dislocation between the real world and what we, where we were. I mean, the cassette thing... And the whole business of putting stuff out in cassettes was to do with freedom. And, and we knew that we were giving up a lot of freedom to do this, to, to become commercial. What about the various labels that went around at that time? Now, we know they've changed again, but uh, it's, I suppose if you take a broader view of it, to think that what experimental music was one label put on it, that it's mm. now gone to sort of like dance music and, and traditionally you might think dance oh. music is a regulated kind of thing so you don't mean like record labels you mean like the tags that yeah you put yeah. on them yeah well i mean um back then things were described as being industrial now uh industrial music means to me late 70s folk music of london and manchester and the built-up cities of england and a band like throbbing gristle is a folk band and uh, really, we could never have been industrial because we're from Sydney. If you look out the window, it's not quite bleak, is it? Um, we never claimed to be industrial. We, we, we were just our own thing. I think we described it as fungal disco or something, whatever, anything to annoy people. Um, but industrial music was picked up by the Americans, as things are, and it was turned into um, industrial dance music. Uh, it's funny, around about the time that you weren't allowed to say discotheque and you had to start saying dance club, um, 
this industrial music thing. There was a kindred thing because the people who did dance music at that time and the people who did so-called industrial music at that time were both interested in sound and sound sculpture and the, the use of sound. And so you could run between the two. Um, but the labels always came much later. The labels always came when people were trying to put it in record bins. Was it not surprising, though, to uh, start hearing something like Chicago House and Detroit Techno, uh, which uh, I guess my point of entry on that music was more like the late 80s. Now, I don't know if it was happening, how much it was happening earlier. It's funny to read now about all these people from places like Washington and Detroit and Chicago who all cite us as an influence. I mean, that's, uh, it sort of makes up for the obscurity that we face um, nine days out of every ten. But, um, Obviously, it starts with craft work. Um, it's very funny to hear uh, craft work doing trans Europe Express gets picked up and turned into Planet Rock, uh, which gets resampled and reused in so-called black underground music from, from then on. Um, we were also another white band from the British Empire kind of thing that was absorbed into that underground American thing. Um, but you can't it's it, you know we can't yeah we were an influence but they they took a lot further i mean we did it with the same feeling as they did it they did it for their own personal reasons so did we maybe we provided them with a language but that doesn't take away from what they did if you had some success in america dance floor kind of uh, play, yeah. dance charts. Yeah. Was there then a pressure was going into the studio part oh, of that to produce more well, dance records? No, it was, well, yes and no. It was like, well, you've just done a successful record. Can you do five more like that? That was the end of, that was the, you know, we did, we did a record that did really well. And of course the message comes back from America. Well, we'll have four more like that, thank you. And that is at the point where we realized, oh my God, I've done the wrong thing. You know, we had this perfectly free underground thing and suddenly it had been turned into like a complete ball and chain. Sure, we could be successful, but like, you know, it was all over, which is why I don't work that way anymore. I now cut my own CDs, do it all over the Internet. Uh, you want, you know, there, I've got records that I can do now, which only five people in the whole world might want, but they can have it because we'll just bash off five of them. You know, the whole idea of press a thousand and try and get rid of them. It's all over. So this is down to music as, I, you know, you're talking about folk and, and I tend to see it a bit that way too. To me, mm. it's kind of like this kind of technological kind of liberation has actually got us back to pure folk forms. Cottage industry. Yeah, we're back in the cottage. I mean, uh, the spinning wheel, when it was invented, must have been a major technological breakthrough compared to like whatever they did before, like beating two rocks together or whatever. And like we're talking about like CD cutters, home CD cutting and stuff as if it was like an absolute marvel. But, you know, like a thousand years from now, we're just back in a cottage in industry period. You know, people sitting at home making their own music, putting on CD.